Hey everybody and welcome back to Moda with Ellery and in this episode we're going to uh, complete the round trip and bring our Moto renders um, back into After Effects and have a complete finished uh, VFX composite where um, now we have started in After Effects doing uh, some little trimming on the video and then motion tracking to get the 3D camera solved, importing that into Moto using the After Effects IO kit, uh, then going into Moto, building our scene and then adjusting lighting and shading and textures to make sure that everything lines up and looks proper, uh, properly placed with our um, pre-shot scene. And now we're going to take those renderings and put them back into After Effects to have a completed composite. So um, right here is uh, is pretty much where we had left off. You know, we've got the scene built, and now there is something that came up when I was actually working on this, and it's something that I had not seen before with Moto renders. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I included this instead of just uh, glossing over it and showing the finished product. Now, with a lot of things that I've done with this, so doing this exact same technique, um, you usually end up with a background that's fairly solid and works pretty well, even if you don't want to do any, um, you know, significant post work. If you don't want to piece everything together, if you just want to essentially have um, your CG elements overlaid on your uh, camera backdrop, which is your initial video with the shadow catcher, that tends to work all right. Now, in this case, let's hop over to After Effects here. Um, I'll show you what happened, and that was as as I rendered this, um, and now you watch this played back, watch how the car moves around, and the ball as well. So what we're seeing is we're getting a multiplication of some of the, um, some of the vertical movement of the camera, so the fact that I shot this um, handheld walking around, you know, no, no uh, steadying or anything like that, um, I was trying to go for that handheld feel, but that was uh, multiplied in uh, in the backdrop of the Moto background. So now, really, this isn't a big deal because in a lot of cases, you will actually want to take your CG elements with alpha channels and shadow catchers separately, and then apply them over uh, the the pre-shot backdrop, which is exactly what we're going to do here. But I wanted to show you what happened. Now, um, as another reference, if uh, if you looked at the uh, the initial tutorial in this three-part series, uh, there was another one that was a desktop tracking scene of just moving around um, some space on a desktop with um, you know a monitor in the background, and then you can take and uh, place items into that scene. Now, that one works perfectly well. The camera track and importing it into Moto and everything worked fine. No issues. So, this is something that you may want to do on a shot by shot basis, but I want you to know that you know if you get results like this, uh, don't worry, it's uh, your your work is not ruined, and uh, and we can actually go through and make some fixes and some adjustments. And it only takes a few extra steps uh, in both your rendering and in your compositing phases, but it also gives you a lot more flexibility. So it's good practice to know how to do these things anyway. So that being said, let's hop back over into Moto for a moment, and we're going to look at some of the things that I rendered out of Moto in order to give me everything that I needed to create a finished composite inside of After Effects. So in order to make a shot like this work, we're going to need a few individual pieces. Now, um, as I would mentioned, if everything is going to work perfectly well with your alignment, your camera, and your projection, um, you can get away with just rendering out one image sequence and calling it a deal. Now, in this kind of case, we're going to need a few individual parts. And let's start in the back and work forward. So we're going to need the initial backplate, which is fine. We've got that already done. That was what was filmed off of our camera, and we've got that ready to go. The next thing that we're going to need is going to be a shadow pass, and that's going to give us essentially the same information as the shadow catcher, which is going to apply shadows from any of our CG elements onto our uh, our filmed backplate. Okay, so that's going to be these contact shadows that we see underneath the car, and also the ones here underneath the ball. Um, now. We can also, uh, if we have anything more complex, we may need to have a more complicated shadow catcher, but in this case, uh, the one that we have works fine. Just know that uh, if you have any more complex geometry inside of your actual uh, filmed scene, uh, then you have to take that into account when you're creating that shadow pass. But that's really no different than when we were creating the initial uh, CG work in the previous episode. So the next thing that we're going to need moving forward, the third level, is going to be um, all of our rendered elements. So in this case, it's going to be 
the car and the sphere. If we had anything else in there, obviously those could be um, included as well. Now, depending on how you're going to do this, you may or may not want to render those out individually. Now, just remember that if you render them out individually, you'll have to take uh, reflections into account as well as um, self-shadowing or the shadows between in individual objects. Now, in the case of what I'm going to do, I'm just going to render out all of my, um, my CG elements here as one pass. Uh, and then what I'm going to do, and this is the last step, is I'm going to render out individual alpha channels for both the car and for the sphere. Now to set up a shadow pass, and really there are a number of different ways to do this, but the way that I'm going to do this, um, I'll, I'll show you here, um, is just we want to create a white backdrop and we want to create uh, just darkness where the shadows exist. And really that's it. Now, you could do this in another way where you're using the shadows as a mask and then uh, you're applying that mask to something like uh, an adjustment layer where you're color correcting. Uh, but really, this gives you a lot of flexibility and if you need the inverse, you can always just invert the layer and that also works. So uh, just a note there. So what I'm going to do is I want to create this in such a way that I have um, no car and no ball visible and no backdrop visible but I still want to see all of the shadows that are being cast from these CG elements onto my shadow catcher. All right, now in order to do that, I've got my hybrid, which you can see right here, and I've got my uh, ball all up above the base shader, and they have their own shaders. So if I go up here and I choose filter on shader, you'll see now I just have my shaders. So I've got my reflective ground, and that was what's casting the reflection from the backdrop up onto our CG environments. Uh, we've got the shadow catcher, which is where the shadows from the CG elements land on top of the uh, the filmed backdrop. Then we've got one for the hybrid and one for the ball and then just our normal base shader for anything else that would go underneath there. So all I need to do is select the ball and the hybrid and I can shift click and select them both together. Um, and then I'm just gonna uncheck visible to camera. They're still going to be visible to all my shadows and everything else. And now you can see that they disappear, but their shadows remain. And this is really uh, what we're looking at, uh, at getting at. Now, as another side note here, if you happen to have a backdrop that is working well and you still want to be able to separate out your foreground from background elements, um, as we're going to do here, but you don't have any kind of jitter or mismatch between uh, your camera motion and uh, your CG, that's totally fine. You can actually just render out like this. In this case, however, we do have an issue where this backdrop is not aligning properly. So we need to get just a clean backdrop. And a really easy way to do this is to, let's go ahead and turn off my uh, my shader filter there. Um, it's just to go down to the environments. And you can see here, I've got my environment. This one is set to uh, visible to camera and it has the parking lot in it. All I've done is gone and created a constant white and I just set that above it and then we make that visible, and there you go. And that's really all you need. And at this point, you can actually just render out essentially a beauty pass, which is going to be uh, the final color output. You can leave out all the others and just render. And this is all that you're going to need in order to make this work. Now, a note here on render quality. Um, we're going to be able to render at different qualities depending on what we're rendering out here. And uh, mostly this is going to depend on what kind of noise or artifacting uh, we see in the render. Now, granted, if you have a ton of time to render or if you have a lot of uh, render power, then you don't have to optimize as much. You can just render out at the highest quality and call it a deal. Uh, but for most of us, uh, including myself right now, especially uh, I have a dead laptop, so I'm on my only main workstation right now, so I can't always spare it to render as much as I would like to. Um, but I want to optimize this, and so I want good quality out of these shadows. Um, the one thing that you'll notice very quickly on shadows is that if you're using uh, global illumination, uh, the kind of noise that you get is this uh, lumpy, wavy, artifacty looking noise, and it moves around quite a bit. Um, even if you turn on walkthrough mode, it still can cause some serious issues um, with the way it looks. It's, it lacks a lot of uh, clarity and uh, accuracy. Whereas right now, you can see that the way that this is working, I've got the actual contact points for the sphere here up front, 
for the four tires and then also the heavy shadows that are being cast by each of the tires with a little bit of space where the rims are not casting as much shadow and overall everything is looking fairly balanced and nice um, and this is also very clean we're not noticing any in the way of anything in the way of kind of uh, kind of lumpy artifacts all right um, and in order to achieve that the, the easiest way to get this done is to just go to your render settings and global illumination and enable environment importance sampling that is going to greatly improve the accuracy of the lighting that we're getting from our um, our environment, which is that uh, uh, that HDR environment that we're using, and this is going to give us a good quality without having to futz around a whole lot with these other um, values. Okay, so this is going to work really well here. We don't have a lot in the way of complexity of surfaces or anything like that, uh, and so this is going to give us a fairly decent render time. You can see I've uh, just let this uh, render here in preview well. Uh, we've been looking at this, and it only took 40 seconds for this frame. Um, this is not quite at full resolution, but, uh, you know, we're looking at maybe a minute of frame and probably less if we were to optimize a little bit. Um, this, I have my environment uh, rays set to 256. You could probably back them off to 128, again, depending on uh, the quality of render that you have. I'm going to be rendering these out at 720p, uh, but remember, if you're going to render at 1080, it's essentially double the pixels, so... Um, you know, about double the render time. So just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, so this is how I'm going to render this out. Um, if you would like, you can set up render passes to get this all automated. Um, I'm just rendering these out separately, um, and that works for me because the uh, amount of time that I have that I can leave my computer at the moment is only about as much time as... You know, I have to render out a single pass anyway. Um, if you can leave your computer rendering for 12 or 24 hours or whatever the case may be that you need as far as time goes for rendering, you you may want to set up render passes to get all these knocked out in one fell swoop, and then you don't have to go back and reset anything up. Um, but anyway, that's all we need here for our shadow. And this is going to be the shadow pass that will then dump directly on top of the initially filmed backdrop. So... After we have this, and those two pieces will go together, we now need our CG elements and our alpha channels. So let's go ahead and I'm going to turn off the constants so we get back to our uh, regular backdrop. And now let's again go back up to our uh, shaders, and I'm going to select the ball and the hybrid, and I'm going to turn them back on to visible to camera. And then let's turn our filter off, and I'm going to go up to the render options and in global illumination. And now, in the case of uh, the rest of our objects, no, not our shadows, but our actual objects in the scene, we want to see less of the grainy kind of noise. Um, that's very easy to hide in something like a shadow pass. You can either add a little bit of a blur or, um, or uh, something like that, or some denoise to clean up a little bit of uh, kind of grainy noise, but we don't want to see that so much in uh, in the sides of the actual um, objects. We, we would like to be able to apply some uh, grain to those to get things to match and line up or maybe to add some stylization, but we don't want to add grain on top of grain on top of grain. It's going to start to look uh, really messy very quickly. So in order to minimize the amount of grain that we're getting, um, we're going to turn off environment importance sampling. This is going to give us slightly faster render times, um, but it's also going Going to limit the amount of noise that we're getting to the more large scale kind of wobbly artifacty kind of noise um, and you can actually see it here underneath the car where it's really prevalent where we have this kind of wavy undulation and that's not really what we want at all um, and actually here if I take the hybrid really quickly and make it not visible to camera. You can see how much less clean this is. Um, it's much less accurate. It's uh, It looks more like an oil stain than an accurate shadow. Uh, so let's turn the car back on. Um, but that isn't going to matter in this because the only thing that we're going to end up seeing out of this pass are our CG elements, not our background, not our shadow. So we've got the actual CG elements and then I've got alphas for the car and we can check these out here. Here's our car alpha. You can see it has some semi-transparency on the windows. And then we have also for the sphere, the ball, um, which is just a solid alpha. Now, one note here about uh, the car alpha is sometimes when you have transparent areas, um, you have to watch out that if you have something in your uh, refractive uh, settings for your environments. So if, for example, um, this one here was set to uh, visible to refraction rays, which is our transparent rays, sometimes that will wash out your alpha channel. Um, so it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, and also having something in the backdrop of the camera itself. So if we go to our tracker camera, if I had something here in this foreground, 
or excuse me, background image. So if I were to put, you know, for example, this in there, sometimes this will also wash out your alpha channel. So just be aware of that. Uh, make sure if you have transparency on your alpha channels that it actually is appearing in your alphas. So just something to keep in mind. Otherwise, we're going to end up with completely blacked out windows and we won't get any kind of um, movement behind the car. And we want to see a little bit, even those tinted windows, we want to see a little bit of what's going on behind the other car. Um, all right, so just to make sure that that works right, I'm also going to go and turn the visible to refraction off on all of my environments. So you see I have visible to reflection, visible to camera, and then... Um, on the very bottom one, visible uh, to indirect rays. So I don't have anything on my refraction, and that's fine because this is just going to lay over uh, the top of the background plate. Now from here, we're actually ready to go out and render out our individual sequences. So we'll render out our shadow pass, and I just rendered that out separately. And then I rendered out my beauty passes, which is my final uh, color output, along with my alpha channels, all in uh, one pass uh, as a Photoshop layered sequence. Now you can also render these out as individual sequences, but I just wanted to show um, all of the different workflows so that we can consider those while we're actually working inside of After Effects. So with that, let's hop back over into After Effects. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna start a new project. So we get rid of everything here. And I'm gonna start just by importing, and I'm gonna do um, uh, Control, Alt, or Command, Option, I for import um, if you're on a Mac. And that's gonna allow us to do uh, multiple imports. So what I'm gonna do here first is let's go back. Um, I'm gonna go back to episode 10, which has my image sequence. I'll have all these included in the main folder if you're, um, if you're getting the downloadable content so that you don't have to go fishing around for them. Uh, but let's get our parking lot backdrop here. So we'll click import. And that will bring us, since we didn't um, import multiple, um, this is going to bring us right back into the import window. So it saves us the time of having to do that. Uh, and then here's our shadow pass, which I'll bring in, which is also a Targa sequence. And this one uh, probably has the alpha channel left on it, but I don't need it. So I'm just going to click ignore and OK. Uh, and then we'll go back in here and here's our main pass. And this is the one that has our beauty pass, the final color output, as well as uh, the individual alphas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this one import. We want to make sure that it's imported as footage, not as composition, which is the actual default with a PSD file. And instead of merged layers, I want to choose a layer. And I just want to get, in this case, I want to start by getting the final uh, color output. We'll click OK. And then we'll import again. And again, we'll choose layers. And I want to get the car alpha. Click OK. Import again. And in this last one, we will get our uh, ball alpha. And we'll click OK. Now, there are a couple of other alphas that were rendered out there, um, but I don't need those for what we're working on, so I'm just going to leave them out. Um, and we'll click OK. Those were f for my previous setup that I had uh, assumed that we were going to get a clean backdrop out of this. So uh, let's go ahead and click Done. And now we have all of the individual pieces. So there's our backdrop. There's our shadow. There is our final color, there's the car alpha, and the ball alpha. So now we need to construct this, and we want to set this up in such a way that we have good control over all of the individual pieces um, without having to uh, go through a bunch of hoops. And one thing that After Effects uh, has a difficulty with in its workflow is um, applying um, effects that will channel through within a given composition. Now, in, in that case, I mean, if I have uh, an image here or an image sequence like my car alpha, let's go ahead and open that up. Um, if I have this car alpha, which has this car in it, um, and I make any adjustments to this and then try to use this as an alpha channel for my final color, it's not going to work that well right off the bat. Um, because it's not going to allow me to make changes to the colors and then use those changes um, in the actual alpha. So you have to make a, a kind of a bunch of pre comps here. And that's all right because this isn't, uh, this will just take us a few seconds to set up and then we'll have everything ready. So basically what we, what we want to do here is we want to create a composition for each of these alphas. So I'm just going to drag down and make a comp for this one, um, which I'm going to rename car alpha. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing with the ball. So we'll make another comp for this, which we will rename ball alpha. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and take my final output color, and I'm going to create uh, two comps out of this. So I'm just going to go ahead and do both of them right now. And it's going to come in as main passes one and main passes two, but I'm going to rename these to 
car and ball. Okay. And then I'm also even going to do this with the backdrop. So let's make the backdrop here. And remember the backdrop is at 1080p. So I'm also gonna do some things with scaling here, which I'll explain in a moment. And let's rename this one backdrop. Okay, and what I'm going to do is initially, I'm gonna take all of the 720p items and I'm gonna scale them up to fit the 1080p. And then I will take the entire thing and scale it back down to 720p. Um, and the reason that I'm doing this uh, scaling up and then back down is anytime you can take any kind of individual operation that's going to affect an entire composite and you apply it to the composite together, it's going to tend to cause the pixels to blend together a little bit better. So um, a lot of times I like to think of it this way, where when you're creating a composite, you have you have essentially three different layers. It's like it's like a, a composite sandwich. So your your base layer is going to be whatever footage you have. Um, your the middle part of your sandwich, um, your your cheese and your meats or your peanut butter and jelly, whatever kind of sandwich you like, is uh, is all your CG elements and anything else that you're compositing in green screen elements, anything like that. Um, stock footage, whatever, you know, all that stuff is, is going to be the middle of the sandwich. And then the top piece of the sandwich is going to be any kind of sweetening or things that you do on top of everything once it's already put together. And uh, that's going to include things like uh, color grading, vignette, uh, adding some noise, adding bloom, adding edge effects, uh, edge bleed, blend blur, um, edge bloom, that kind of things. All that kind of stuff is going to go on top of the composite as a finished set um, and and it's going to allow everything to blend together a little bit better. And it's that top piece of the sandwich bread uh, in composites that's going to make things definitely look a lot better and a lot more integrated as a single uh, cohesive unit and less like a backdrop with some stuff put on top of it. All right, so uh, now that I'm done with that, let's go ahead and I'm going to take now, uh, let's start since we're here with our parking lot. And what we're going to do is we're going to put our shadow on top of this. And it's going to happen right here in the backdrop layer uh, because the shadow and the backdrop are essentially one cohesive piece at this point. Uh, we don't want to see any transparency from our backdrop uh, come through onto our objects without the shadow included because it's just going to throw off our colors. It's going to throw off edges and make everything look um, not so good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my shadow here and I'm going to just drop it on top. And you'll notice it is too small. So uh, let's go to scale here and I'm going to scale this up to 150. And now it's actually going to fit. So there we go. Uh, except it's not working right because it's in the wrong blend mode. Now, you can do this, like I had mentioned earlier, as a mask, uh, as an alpha channel to a color correction layer. For the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set this to multiply. And now we actually see our shadows on top of our backdrop. Um, and I can apply any kind of grading that I want to this, and it's going to lightly color my shadows. We are going to put a levels adjustment on here at very least, um, just to be able to get the shadows to more closely mimic the backdrop shadows. Um, but you can get away with just doing it like this, and this works pretty well as, um, as well. Um, we'll look at some of the other options that we have for compositing shadows uh, in the next uh, VFX series. Okay, so now we've got our backdrop with our actual, you know, um, shadows put on there. The next thing that we're going to need is uh, going to be our cut out individual elements. And you could do these as one piece, the car and the ball together. I'm doing them separately and that way I have individual color control and all sorts of uh, nice stuff like that. So um, here inside of my car um, comp, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab my car alpha comp. I'm just going to drag and drop this in here and then I'm going to hide it because I don't need to see it. All I need is its values. So let's go in here and I'm going to use set channels and you're going to use set channels a lot uh, when you're working in uh, After Effects doing compositing because it's going to allow you to apply an alpha channel uh, to an image and it's uh, if you're working in a node based compositing system you would just plug these in as an alpha but we don't have that option here. So we'll just put set channels right on there and then all we need to do is we need to go to source layer 4 which is the alpha channel so RGB a uh, and we want to set the source to our car alpha okay and then we want to change it from the alpha because that doesn't have an alpha on it it's just a uh, an image sequence we want to set that to the luminance values all right so now you see everything went black but as we pan through here now we actually have the car moving around properly as it should great let's do the same thing with the ball so let's go over to ball Again, I'm going to go up to my project here. I'm going to grab my ball alpha. 
drop it in, hide it, because we don't need to see it. We'll apply set channels. We'll set the source layer to ball alpha, luminance, and there we go. So now we've got the ball in there. Excellent. So now we're going to take the next step of hopping back into um, the backdrop here that has our shadows on it, and we're going to bring in those two pieces. So we're going to go to project here, and I'm going to bring in car, and I'm going to put the car on first, and then I'm going to put the ball in front of it just because the ball is in front. Uh, even though they have their own individual alphas, we still want to uh, keep them stacked in a good order. So now we'll take our ball, put it in there. Now both of these are too small, so we'll tap S for the scale and type in 150 and that will automatically size everything up. And now, if we play through this, here I can just back up and uh, hit play. It's not gonna go at real time, but we'll get the idea. Now, if we play through this, we should see that this is actually going to line up properly, whereas uh, when we initially had brought in the comp, just directly how it was rendered out of Modo, uh, we were getting all of that really strange, bouncy stuff where the, uh, the vertical motion and tilt was being multiplied across um, the composite of the backdrop. So now everything is pretty clean. Uh, this is not a 100% perfect track, but it is pretty good. Now, um, just a note, if you're going to film something like this, um, and you're hopefully going to have some people to help out, uh, it's a good idea to go down and put some small tracking markers out where uh, you're going to be working. You know, if you knew you're going to have a car over here, for example, you know, go and put some tracking markers down. Little pieces of tape would be great. Um, I was shooting this on my own spur of the moment because um, I was looking for a good area and I just had the moment that I could grab this. So I did, but I didn't have any assistance with me or anything like that. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. You will get a cleaner track if you have some extra known points to track. But this track is pretty good, especially for our purposes here. All right, so now we see that we're actually getting this. And we're getting some transparency through the windows, which is great. Um, we're getting our shadow on the ground, but the shadow does not quite look right. And I'm going to scrub back to about right here, because this is a point where you can see a shadow on this car right here, and this shadow, you can see this shadow is much too light. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to this, um, uh, the shadow pass, and what I'm going to do is just apply a levels. So let's go to color correction and levels. And now all we really have to do is uh, adjust the midtone here. So if I take this midtone and I pull it more to the right, you'll see that the shadows are going to get darker in the core, but it's not going to affect much of the overall softness of it. So what we're looking for is we're looking for this shadow here to kind of match in general intensity to this shadow here. Probably something like that. Now I think this shadow is a little bit cooler than this shadow. So what I'm also going to do here is let's go to um, effect color correction, and I'm going to put a curves on top. So you could do this also with levels. You could do both of these with levels. You could do all of this with one fell swoop, but I, I just want to be able to show, you know, some extra options that you have. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go down to the blue in the alpha, and I'm just going to pull up uh, the blue in these dark tones just a little bit. And if you go too far, you'll notice that this line here is going to start to turn really blue, and that's not what we want. So if I pull this up like this, you can see the line is starting to turn blue. That's too much. So what I'm going to do is just pull this up a little bit. And what I may also do is go to the red and pull this one out the other way just a little bit. So we're just kind of cooling off our shadows just a little bit. So something like that. And you can see if I turn this on and off, it's a pretty subtle correction, but I think that that is worthwhile. So I'm going to leave it on and we'll call it a deal. So now my shadows are pretty much ready to go. Um, and now we actually have our comp you know, close to being ready to go. So this is at a good prototype stage. Um, the next thing that we'll do is actually going in and uh, we want to go in and apply some actual work to the edges of our objects. Now, if this is enough for you for whatever project or learning uh, level you're on and this is as far as you want to go, great. You'll end up with a fairly decent composite. You can even go in and do some color correction here. So um, what I'm actually going to do is lock this composite. So you can see up here in the in the top, I'm uh, pressing the lock and that will lock this viewer. So now I can do something like hop over to the car itself and let's grab the car here and I'm going to go effect and let's do color correction. This time I'm going to do levels. Um, you know, say I had you know, too much blue in here. You know, I could adjust the blue tint of the car, and you can see that it's taking effect, even though I'm working in this uh, composite, or this composition, I'm actually seeing it here in my finished comp, so just something to note here is, uh, you know, you can make these changes and adjustments here, and I think the blue was just a little too heavy. Uh, so, there we go. So that turns off some of the 
some of the extra hit from that blue that was making it, I think, a little bit too uh, too kind of glowy looking. And uh, and now I, I could make those other color corrections on there, but I just want to show that you can do that uh, really easily without changing anything else in this uh, composition setup. So now the next thing that we're going to do to treat our edges is we're going to create an edge mask. And you can get as deep and complex on these uh, topics as you want. I will go in more uh, depth in a later episode, but I just want to show you the general idea uh, here first of all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over to my projects here, and I'm going to take my ball alpha and I'm going to duplicate it, and I'm going to take my car alpha, and I'm going to duplicate that as well. Uh, so let's open up car alpha 2, which is now our new alpha. And what I want to do is I just want to see kind of the rim, the edge of the object. And in this case, I don't want to see the windows or anything. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a levels adjustment. So let's go up to effect, color correction, and again, I'm going to use levels. And all I need to do is grab my uh, my center point here and drag it. And you can see as I go to the right, that's going to make the windows uh, more transparent because it's getting black. Um, and then if I go to the left, it's going to flatten the windows out. And really what I'm looking for here is uh, just kind of getting the windows almost all the way white. You may have to pull this white point back too, just a little bit. All right, so something like that and let's actually balance that a little bit so I'm pulling my uh, end white point down and then my midpoint down just a little bit and something like that all right so now what we want to see is we just want to see this inside edge so now what we're going to do is we're going to create a duplicate of this which we'll just hit command D and this one is going to just basically give us what is going to be left over so right now we have everything in the car great everything beyond the car is black so if I set this blend mode to multiply now right now it's not gonna look any different but uh, if I go to this underlying layer, and I'm going to start by inverting it, so you can just type in uh, invert here, and we'll just double click. So now the underside layer is um, basically black where the car is, so that's what we're actually seeing right now. Uh, and then it's white. Right now we just see a little bit of difference in kind of the anti-aliasing at the edges. But if I apply a blur here too, so let's go to effect, blur, and sharpen, Gaussian blur. And the more blur I turn in, the more you're going to see that the the white is going to come from the edges and it's going to bleed in towards the rest of the car. Now, depending on how deep you're going to make this, um, you'll want to adjust this and you may want two separate versions of this. But in this case, I'm just going to use one version. Um, and if it seems too heavy, that's all right. We can always back things off. So uh, we're going to end up taming this layer down significantly once we actually apply it. So let's put this, uh, I'm going to go somewhere around seven pixels. And really, this is blurring from that center. So we're only getting about three and a half pixels in, which is probably good for just creating a little bit of a light wrap on our object here. So, um, yeah, so let's go, yeah, I'll leave that at seven. We'll call that good. And now I'm going to do the same thing very quickly on the ball alpha. So let's go to our project. We'll go to ball alpha two. And again, I'm going to take this guy, duplicate it, set it to multiply. Take the underlying one. Here we can scrub down so we can see it. Take the underlying one. I'm going to invert it. I'm going to blur it. So let's go effect, uh, blur and sharpen. Gaussian blur, and I'm going to go for that same level of blur right now, so just seven pixels. There we go, and now we see we got this same kind of thing. We've got the outside edge, and it's just bleeding inwards a little bit, and we're going to allow a little bit of extra light from our backdrop to bleed over uh, just to kind of tie all of our composited elements together. All right, so let's hop over to the backdrop, and we'll actually apply this now. So what we'll do here is we're going to create a uh, actually two duplicates of our backdrop and those are going to drop inside of here and they're going to apply to our actual um, to our actual edges that's going to allow some of the backdrop colors to wrap around the objects and this is going to give us the feel that they're something that's actually being lit and you know placed in a real world environment now one thing to note here is that if I just apply just this parking lot backdrop here without the shadow on top it's going to mess up what's going on here. So we're actually going to, uh, we're going to want to pre-comp um, these two items together so that when we use the light wrap, we don't get uh, you know a lit parking lot space um, wrapping around the bottom of these tires. It's gonna make them glow and just not look right. And the same thing with the bottom of the sphere. So I'm gonna select both of those, right click, pre-compose. This is also another way that you can set up your comps. So just a side note here. And I'm gonna call this light wrap Um, backdrop. 
Okay. So now that we have this all is, is one piece, what I can do is just duplicate it and move it up. And this one I'm going to put right above the car, right? Uh, and then I'm going to go to my projects panel and I'm going to bring in uh, both the ball alpha 2 and the car alpha 2, which are essentially my light wrap alphas. And then I'm going to go up here to my light wrap backdrop and I'm going to bring in set channels. And what I want to do is set my source for to, let's do car alpha two, and I want to set it to the luminance. And now you can see, it almost looks like it went away. But if we zoom in here, and let's kind of zoom in towards the back of the car here, and if I toggle this off and back on, you'll see that it is just giving us that little bit of um, opacity of the background wrapping onto here. So now really it's just a, a matter of kind of fine tuning and adjusting this. Now in some cases you'll want to set this to a blend mode of screen. That's going to be if you tend to have areas where you're getting some kind of abnormal shadows, setting it to screen will make it so you only get the brighter areas wrapping on. Now this backdrop is fairly subdued, uh, except for maybe where the, the white minivan is in the backdrop, uh, but it's fairly subdued so we're not going to see a lot of it. Um, if you happen to have uh, weird shadows, though, you can do that. If you happen to see odd glows in different places, you might try setting it to multiply, and what that's going to do is bring some of the darker elements around. So just a couple of options that you have. But either way that you go, you're going to want to back this off significantly because at 100%, uh, it's a little on the heavy-handed side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, press T to bring up my opacity, and then I'm going to back this to maybe 30%, 30 and a couple at most. And now if we click this off and back on, you can see it's a really subtle effect, but it's just one of those things that's going to help uh, give your composite a little bit more realistic feel to it. So now what I'm going to do is, since I have this one all set up, all I want to do is have another one that does the same thing on the ball. So all I have to do is uh, Command D to double, uh, create a duplicate of that. And in this one, we'll just go up to uh, Source 4 Layer and we'll just set that to Ball Alpha 2. And now it applies to the sphere. So again, if we just toggle this off and back on, oops, actually it helps if we drag it to the right place. We drag it above the ball, there we go, off and back on. And see, it's a little more subtle on the ball, so I'm actually going to uh, increase my opacity just a little bit. Let's go up so you can see it at 100%. So off and back on, see how that's wrapping up there. You definitely see it in these highlights. Uh, that is too heavy though now, so let's back it off to maybe 40%. And we're just looking for, again, a little bit of the inclusion of the backdrop into uh, our our CG composite stuff. And that's going to allow the pieces to get kind of married and tied together a little bit better. So now we come into essentially what is the last step, and that's going to be the sweetening, putting everything together, and this is that top layer of bread um, that we're going to go with. So now, uh, and actually the light wrap is kind of the the, the first shot over the bow of this uh, final pass, so we're getting a little bit of including everything together. Now the next thing that we're going to do is really start to put everything into a finished piece. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go over to my project. So I'm going to take this backdrop comp, and I'm just going to put it in another comp, right? Which this one I'm going to rename Final, because this is actually where all of the uh, the fun stuff is going to happen. So um, there are a few different things that you can do here, and I'm just going to scrub down to a nice frame here that has everything together. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the entire composition to 720p. So uh, we're going to be done with looking at our stuff scaled up too high. Okay, so now we can take and scale this down. Now, if we want, we could go to you know pretty much exactly. Uh, so that's going to be about 67%. And I would like to err on the side of having just a tiny bit of pixel buff around the edge instead of getting like a black border or anything like that. So there you go. So now we have everything, and now it's properly scaled. We're down to 720p, which is uh, what we should be looking at. Uh, and now what we're going to do is now we can start applying some different things here. And like I said, all of these different things, you don't have to do all these on an individual shot. You don't have to do any of them. Doing some of them or all of them or a combination, depending on the individual shot, depending on uh, the look of the piece around it, this is all stuff that's going to help make your composite look better. Um, if you have other shots with no CG in them in the same piece and you're going to do any grading or any look work on them, make sure that you do that look work at the end with your CG composite pieces. While you can take a completely done color graded piece for your backdrop and then just color match your foreground elements to it, um, you're going to have a little bit more 
uh, cohesiveness if you take your backdrops untreated and then you apply all your CG elements, color match to that, and then grade the whole thing. Because again, it's that top piece of sandwich bread that's going to smush everything together and make it look as if it's one more cohesive unit. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do um, a couple of different things here. Um, I'm going to put a slight vignette on this, and I'm going to put a little bit of also kind of a bloom and a little bit of noise, okay? And then the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually apply a little bit of a... Um, uh, of a chromatic aberration, and I'm going to do this manually. Now, there are some ways to do it automatically. I understand that, um, but I think it's a good way to introduce some other ways that you can deal with color um, inside of uh, your compositions. So I'm going to do it manually. Uh, if you don't want to see it done manually, then fast forward when I get to that part. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start here, layer, new, and I'm going to add an adjustment layer. And I know that I can just apply a vignette effect I understand that. Um, I want to do the vignette manually, and the reason that I'm going to do it manually is so that I have more precise control over it. So I can see exactly what's going on. I can do all sorts of things where I could even um, offset my grade on the backdrop just for the vignette area, all that kind of thing. Whereas if I just apply the vignette, I only have control basically over how intense and how um, close to the edges it is, and that's it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, and I'm actually just going to mask out this layer here, this uh, adjustment layer. And let's see, I'm just going to mouse right over the middle, click in, oops, helps if I have the actual ellipse, not the rounded rectangle. So let's go right to the center. And I'm just going to click and drag out. And if you hold down the uh, control key or the command key on a Mac, it will toggle you out to uh, drawing from center instead of drawing from the corners. And what I'm looking for is just kind of right tight out towards the edges. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be my mask, which I will need to invert. Uh, and now I can start by going up to effect color correction, and I'm just going to use uh, exposure here for this one. And what I'm going to do, uh, and I do this pretty often in uh, Photoshop as well, is I'm going to start by pulling the exposure down a little bit. And the gamma uh, down as well. So I'm actually doing these two things together. Okay, so something like that's going to work. Now, the only problem, though, is that I have um, this hard mask edge, and so I'm going to go in and put, you know, maybe a 200 pixel blur here on it to feather that, and then I may also want to pull some mask expansion if that's getting a little bit too heavy-handed, so that's going to pull the mask out towards the edges. So, you know, there's a really simple vignette, okay? Now, I have a ton of control over this, though. Um, if I want to tint the edges or burn them or anything, I can do that here. I can just add extra levels in here to my uh, to my my adjustment layer and I can apply that here. Now the other thing that I am going to do just because I feel like it here is I also want the edges to get a little bit less in focus um, just because I feel like it and I'm going to do that here. So I'm going to go uh, again select my adjustment layer, effect, blur and sharpen. I'm just going to put a little bit of a lens blur here. So camera lens blur and let's just, I don't want to go too heavy here. Just something like that just so that we get a little bit more fading around out there. Great. Um, now I'm going to make another adjustment layer, which is actually going to sit underneath here. So let's go layer, new adjustment layer. And this one I am going to apply effect, color correction, and I'm going to do curves on this one. So let's do curves. And what I'm going to do here is basically I'm just going to kind of ramp up my reds in the highlights a little bit and pull them out of the shadows just a little bit. And then I'm, my blues, I'm going to do the opposite, where I pull them out of the highlights a little bit and up out of the shadows, into the shadows a little bit. And this may be a little bit heavy, but the nice thing is, is when you're doing this uh, with an adjustment layer, um, you can get the overall kind of direction that you want. And then you can just go into the layer opacity and you get very fine-tuned granular control over how much of that is actually getting applied. So in this case, I think I'm going to go to about 70%. And there you can see the difference. It's just a little bit cooler, kind of giving it that uh, that blockbuster film kind of look to it. I don't know. It gets a little cheesy and overdone, but hey, you know, uh, I'm in this case, I just want to uh, give the, the idea of how to get this look across. Um, okay, so we've got that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to affect noise, and I'm going to add grain. And let's zoom in here. Now, the default level on grain is way too intense and usually too big. So let's turn our intensity down to maybe 0.4 and our size maybe to 0.5 or 6, um, maybe 0.7. And let's go all the way down to maybe 
three. There we go. And so we're looking right here in this box. So we can see here's without the noise and here's with the noise. Uh, and I think we're good there. So let's go ahead and go to our final, which is going to uh, take out the preview window and we're all set there. And then the last thing I'm going to do is just put a general little bit of bloom and that's going to tend to kind of wash the two elements together. Um, so what I'm going to do here is go to another adjustment layer. And the reason I'm using separate adjustment layers on these um, separate pieces, the color correct is one the and the grain can okay to go okay together. The vignette is a separate one because it has a mask. Now this last one is going to be the bloom. Uh, and this one I want to have individual control over its opacity, which is why I'm doing it separately. So let's go again to color correct. This one we're going to do levels. And I'm going to start just by kind of pulling my black point way up. So we're just looking for uh, the highlights to show up here. Right? So something just like maybe like that. I don't want to go super low. Now I'm going to blur the whole thing and set it to screen. So let's go effect, blur and sharpen, Gaussian blur. Let's give a nice, fairly heavy blur on this because I'm also going to fade this out pretty significantly. So something like that. We'll set our blend mode to screen. There we go. And you can see there's the effect, but like I said, it's really heavy. So uh, now I'm going to take the entire thing, go to my opacity and back it off to maybe 50%. And then, you know, a good idea is just to toggle these off and back on and just see the effect. Now, if that looks a little too glowy for you, obviously just back it off a little bit more. I think it's a little bit for my taste. So I'm going to go to 40%. And there you go. So now uh, what we're looking at here is we're going essentially from, and here, let's just make a duplicate of this for right now. Uh, we're going essentially from this to this. And while it's not a huge change in the overall look, I mean, it's a little bit cooler. We've got a little bit of the vignette and the grain, but overall what it's doing is it's helping pull all of the elements uh, together nicely. All right, so now what I'm going to do, and the last thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a manual um, uh, form of chromatic aberration. That's just going to be right at the edges. Now, the reason I'm going to do this manually is because I want a lot of control over it. Okay, so let's go ahead here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this backdrop, and now I'm going to apply set channels to it. And I'm just going to turn the uh, the effect on uh, before I duplicate because I need three copies of the layer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split this into red, green, and blue channels respectively. So what I'll do here is I'll take the bottom layer and I want to keep the red channel. And then the green and the blue, we both want to set to off. So off, off. And then on the second one, I want to have green on and then red and blue will both be set to off. And then on the top one, I want to keep blue on and the red and the green will both be set to off. So now what we're looking at is there's our blue, there's our green, there's our red. Great. So now we just have to take our top two layers, set their blend mode to add, and we get back to where we were. I know, it's, sometimes it seems like a lot of work to get back to where you started, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> because now we actually have separated out channels that we can do stuff with. Now, in something like Photoshop or in a in a nodal compositing engine, you wouldn't have to do that. But inside of After Effects, you know, we don't really have the the option of breaking out our channels so uh, so easily, so readily. So I'm just going to have three different copies, set the top two to add, and it gets us back to the original. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my red channel, and now what I'm going to do is apply the CC lens here. And uh, initially, this is going to look just terrible because it's going to uh, its size is going to be um, really crazy. It's going to turn the layer kind of into a sphere. So here, let's solo this layer so you can see what's going on. It's kind of turned it into a sphere. Now, just so you know, if I set this up to 500, it's essentially going to be back to where it was. Uh, but then I also want to back off and you can see what's happening is is it's just kind of pulling on those edges. So for chromatic aberration, what we're seeing is typically we see a little bit of separation towards the edges of the lens where we start to get a little bit of uh, pulling apart of the individual colors. And really that's all we're looking at getting here. So if I unsolo this now, or Han solo this, something like that. If I unsolo this now, and now we can actually see the effect as we adjust this. So if I set the, let's set the convergence to maybe 20%. So now you can see we're getting that little bit of separation there. And then I can also adjust this convergence size down and we will probably get too far too fast here. But the cool thing about this is it's not having any effect on the center of the composite. So we're not seeing any problems there. You can see up here where it is going to be the most is going to be the actual corners. Uh, and there you can see it's actually way too heavy. So what I'm going to do here is let's just pull this up and you can really get some super fine tuned adjustment on this. So if I go up to something like that, and then maybe even back it off just a little bit more, maybe to 15, there you go. And it's okay, I think up here in these corners, if it's a little bit uh, 
a little bit more separated, that's okay. And what we'll see is that cyan fringe and that red fringe there, the magenta fringe. And that's all we're really looking for. Now, if you go up a little higher levels, you'll actually get some of it more towards the edge of the ball here. Um, but if we go back here, the ball actually comes from off screen kind of in this corner. So we'll actually start to see a little bit of it there. So if I back this down to maybe 460, we'll start to see a little bit of that separation there and a little bit right there. But again, it's as soon as it gets a few pixels in, it totally fades off. And there you go. So now we've got this uh, pretty much set up the way we want. Now, obviously, like I said, not all of these individual elements of finishing or uh, or kinds of composites are going to be useful or necessary on every individual piece. The idea here is to take the ones that you need for your project, apply them, and then just know that you have the other options to be there if you need to make any fine tune adjustments. Uh, if you have a project that everything doesn't work quite right, like the track and the in the moto background don't line up right. Don't worry, there are options to go around and still get it fixed and still make everything look nice. So I know this was a long one. It covers a lot of info. Uh, hopefully this is useful to everybody. If you like episodes like this or uh, or if you'd like to see more tutorials like this, uh, please check out my Patreon account. That's patreon.com slash Ellery. Uh, you can support there and get downloadable files so you can have all of the content to work with. In this case, it's going to be, um, it's going to be uh, moto files, backdrop images, animated sequences, and uh, and even the uh, the After Effects comp here. If uh, if you'd like to get, you can also get uh, downloadable versions of the video and even uh, individualized instruction if that is something that uh, would be useful to you, either on a professional or private level. It's all fine. Um, or you can also buy this episode or any other one individually a la carte style through Gumroad. That's gumroad.com slash Ellery. You can get downloadable files and downloadable videos there as well. I hope this is helpful to you in your work. Uh, throw me a like and a comment down in the video subscription description if you'd like to see uh, something like this but applied on a different project to something like a Nuke Moto uh, workflow. I'd be happy to do something like that if there's interest. Um, other than that, go make something cool and I'll see you next time.